Uh, it really is a great pleasure to be here uh, and to talk at this Salam Fest and to be back in Singapore and at the uh, IAS. I'm actually going to talk about quantum field theory now and then, uh, but first let me say some words about Abdul Salam and my interactions with him over the years. Uh, Salam was a, an immensely creative and imaginative uh, physicist, and of course his his work over the years had great influence on in me. I didn't meet him until 1974, um, but early in 1973, when our uh, work on uh, Synthetic freedom and uh, the strong interactions was circulating as a preprint. I got a postcard, uh, the email of the past from Trieste, which just said, Dear Gross, congratulations. And I thought that was really nice and sweet. And, um, and I gather characteristic of Salam, who was always open to new ideas and got very excited and, and generous in his appreciation. I actually met him uh, somewhat a little later in the June of the following year at a first time I visited the ICTP in Trieste at a topical meeting on the physics of colliding beams in, 1970, in, the, spr in the spring of 1974. Uh, this was a very exciting meeting. These were exciting times. Um, colliding beams were really E plus E minus colliding beams at that time. And they were uh, finding marvelous things. I was giving my pitch for what soon became named QCD. Uh, and this is, this is uh, in the old days where we used to write on plastic and stick it on the, on the projectors. So these are actually the uh, copies. I just found them. Uh, last night on the ICTP website, which has copies of everything in their activities w going way back. Um, Bert Richter was there and making quite a lot of noise. He gave a talk on the summary of the data from the SLAC uh, experiment, E plus E minus annihilation at Spear. And uh, he was very excited because his data seemed to show that the ratio, the cross-section for plus annihilation to hadrons, which is predicted in any scale invariant theory uh, to be a constant relative to that to leptons. And within QCD, where you can calculate, uh, was predicted if there are only three quarks to be uh, right here. And the data previously had been consistent with this prediction and was uh, one of the arguments for the validity of, of scaling or certainly of QCD. And Richter was seeing too many events here. And he uh, remarked with great enthusiasm, QCD or all of these crazy ideas of the theorists are wrong. He was delighted. Never seen him happier. Um, now, at that time, some of us were timorously saying, well, maybe, you're, maybe there's a threshold here for another kind of quark, which had been, which was really needed, of course, for the consistency of the electroweak theory, the charm quark. Uh, but theorists back in 1974, um, which is three years after my date. I'm going to try to discuss uh, now being 2016 and then being halfway through back in Salam's life, 45 years to uh, 1971 or so, just before things really broke loose, uh, 1971, when Ferrard gave his famous talk at the uh, high energy physics meeting in Amsterdam. So that's 
a dividing line and a good place to compare then and now. So this is a little after now. A lot had happened, but um, Richter was delighted to kill those ideas. And of course, you all know that uh, charm was indeed there. Uh, physicists at that time, the theorists were rather, were rather, I must say, all of us, to some extent, were rather timorous. Not salam, but, uh, but the rest of us were a bit timorous about really pushing hard on a prediction of theory. Uh, that, of course, has changed uh, as we've been so much more successful in the last 40 years. Uh, and the story of electron-positron annihilation is marvelous. This was the situation in June of 74. Richter was making a big deal about this excess of events here, which seemed to be inconsistent with scaling, certainly asymptotic freedom. And he went back and ting, and he discovered the J, and his group discovered the J psi particle and other uh, charm resonances, and continued in this line to discover many interesting particles like bot bottom quark and later uh, <coughs> uh, Carlo and at LEP seen millions of Zs. There are three Nobel Prizes here for charm, bottom, and Z. Uh, Salam was also at, gave a talk at this meeting. Um, he had gotten indeed very excited about uh, uh, the electroweak, about what is now the standard model, the electroweak gauge theory uh, and the strong gauge theory, and was already proposing with Pati a uh, unified gauge theory, including lepton number as the uh, fourth core color. One of the things that always amazed me about Salam was that, that he, would, uh, he was able to hold many different ideas in his mind at the same time, often contradictory. So although he, he loved uh, the standard model, it seems, he didn't give up on his idea, dating way before um, of strong gravity, uh, which goes back to 1971, uh, a tensor theory of the strong interactions, which he continued to work on over the years. Uh, there are some of his collaborators here. Uh, maybe they can explain how he would reconcile these very different points of view. Um, even towards the end, he was proposing by which time I would think that, uh, that QCD and confinement would have been established uh, he was still pursuing the F meson or the strong gravity approach to QCD and confinement. Um, this is a number, another memory I have of, of Salam. I think just before he, his illness really started to incapacitate him uh, when he gave me the Dirac medal in 1986. Now I have another story about Salam and the Nobel Prize. That's Salam, and that's me. <laughs> yeah. An awfully bad picture. I have another story about Salam and the Nobel Prize. As you know, uh, in Nobel's will, uh, it, physics comes first. Physics, chemistry, biology, as it should be, right? <laughs> so because of this, the physicists are treated better than those other sciences. and. Uh, the physicist usually gets to sit next to the queen and the crown princess. And as a, it's a very long banquet, goes on for hours. And so I had, a lot of, I had a chance to talk to the very charming, beautiful queen. And uh, after a while, I ran out of uh, small talk. <laughs> so I, I turned to her and I said, well, you've sat here many years uh, next to a physicist. Uh, who stands out in your mind? And uh, telling this to my favorite laureates, my um, fellow laureates, she found it hard to remember anyone. <laughs> she couldn't come up with any name. And finally she said, oh, I, I do remember one. Uh, 
because he was wearing a turban. <laughs> and I said, oh yes, uh, Abdul Salam. And she said, oh yes, he was and, um, wearing his turban. And then she turned to me and she said, do you know, uh, during the dinner, he asked me whether it would be proper to remove the turban. It was getting uncomfortable. And I said, uh, well, what did you say? And she said, I told him I thought it would not be proper. <laughs> However, in my Google searches of Abdus Salam, I discovered this photo. Well, it's hard to see. But you can definitely see that he's not wearing his turban. Uh, so once again, Salam. Yeah. You see, no turban. <laughs> so you can turn on the lights in the audience, maybe. Uh, can't you turn off these lights? The opposite. Are you the photographer, not the light person? <laughs> okay. Anyway, no turban. Salam, uh, I don't think, took orders from anyone. Now, Salam's great creation, in addition to his contributions to physics, of course, was the ICTP, uh, which, you know, aside from being a marvelous institution for the developing world, which I'll come to in a moment, but was also an inspiration to theorists around the world. I think it really was the first of its kind. And it, I think, had a, um, was one of the inspirations for the ITP in Santa Barbara, which <coughs> came over a decade later. And uh, both institutions have been copied now many, many times throughout the world. And there continue to be new centers of theoretical physics. Uh, but Salam's main intention, of course, was to help develop science and uh, theoretical physics in particular, but science as a whole throughout the developing world. And um, there he truly was inspirational. Um, there was much criticism, I gather, of that effort. And there still is often in developing countries, why do we need basic science? It's too expensive. Why not just technology? And as I go around the world and talk to try to encourage science in the developing world, I often quote uh, Salam's words. It is impossible to talk only of technology transfer. One must talk of science transfer first, science transfer first, and technology transfer later. Unless you're very good at science, you'll never be good at technology. And then his famous quote to uh, opening an address to TWAS, which he established, the Third World Academy of Sciences, scientific thought is the common heritage of mankind. And this is really, I think, what motivated him. It was not just to raise the economic standard of um, the economic um, conditions in the developing world, but to bring them in to participate in, as he said, let, oops, uh, let us provide equal opportunities to all so that they can engage in the creation of physics and science for the benefit of all mankind. OK, then, this is the way the situation with experimental high energy physics then. The United States was dominant. 1971, Fermilab had just started uh, producing uh, physics. Uh, CERN was important. The U.S. had Brookhaven, Slack, Fermilab. It was going strong. Now, CERN dominates the, the world in high energy physics with strong centers in both in the U.S. and Japan. Let me look just for a moment to the future. Soon. I hope the world will look something like this. I don't have that many hopes for 
USA, even under a Trump presidency. <laughs> we can do better, you know, kind of. But uh, I do have great hopes for Asia, which uh, might soon rise to prominence, both in Japan and in China and India. So back then, what was the air of physics, say, before the Amsterdam conference? You know, for years, the reigning uh, search for new principles and new physics and the, or explaining the patterns of the many elementary particles that were discovered were global symmetries. They were the uh, golden ring, discover a new global symmetry. SU2, SU3, SU3 times SU3, spontaneously broken symmetries, etc. Uh, now, we teach our students that global symmetries are either accidental or remnants of local symmetries broken by, uh, not, uh, broken by the background. And this has become evident. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, automatic consequence in the, of the string theory framework, but evident in any theory that contains quantum gravity as, for example, if you have what you thought was a fundamental global symmetry like baryon number conservation, that's a law of nature, baryons are conserved, you can't lose baryons, and you take enough of them and throw them together, they'll form a black hole which has no hair, has no baryon number, and uh, baryon number cannot be conserved in the presence of, of quantum gravity. Black holes eventually evaporate, baryon number is gone. Global symmetries are accidental, proximate, broken, or remnants of broken local symmetries. It's a major change of attitude. Then, back in 1971, we were still under the influence of uh, leader, theoretical theorists who said, like Chu, who was my advisor, Landau in Russia, in the Soviet Union, field theory is dead. And uh, I wonder, maybe somebody can answer this for me among Salam's uh, colleagues. Salam did not seem to uh, follow this trend, which swept throughout the world. And even though he was living in England, which was Cambridge for a while, which was a center of S-matrix theory, some of his collaborators like Matthew, others. Dyson famously said, uh, summarized the, the feeling of impotence of theorists back in the 60s when he said that the correct theory of the strong interaction will not be found for 100 years. Uh, field theory had failed. Field theory was sick, according to Landau. Uh, uh, philosophically wrong, or uh, on the wrong track, according to Chu. And most theorists um, were immersed in S-matrix theory, the bootstrap principle, Reggie theory. Most experimentalists were testing uh, those ideas in measuring total cross-sections, diffraction scattering, and so on. Now, today we have a triumphant field theory of all the atomic and subatomic forces, electromagnetism, weak and strong nuclear forces. We have a standard model a theory based on the identification of the fundamental constituents, quarks and leptons, and deep understanding of the fundamental forces in terms of quantum fields with the Higgs sector added and now confirmed. This standard model, which you can put on a t-shirt, so it's therefore really a theory, uh, is unbelievably successful and a great triumph of uh, fundamental physics. It, uh, Gerard can imagine that you have to do little to it, tweak it here or there, and indeed, and it uh, 
will persist until the Planck length or beyond. Uh, the tests are amazing that we have now. The high precision experiments of the last uh, 40 years are remarkable. These are some of the ones I like the most. Uh, the many, many ways of measuring the strong interaction coupling, which decreases uh, as you go to shorter distances. The incredible um, calculations now in QCD of the uh, cross sections that are being measured with exquisite precision at, at the LHC and agree, <coughs> unfortunately, to, for the experimentalists and for us to some extent, with, the, uh, with theory over 12 orders of magnitude. Quite amazing. And as a theorist, perhaps the thing that satisfies me the most is the ability to calculate the hadronic masses from first principles with almost no free parameters in now something like 1% agreement with uh, observation. These are the ordinary hadrons that were being discovered when I was a graduate student in such great prolifer proliferation. These are uh, bottom uh, states uh, containing bottom quarks. QCD indeed uh, is probably the most remarkable sub-system, uh, part of the standard model in of itself. Uh, it's the best example we have of a theory with no adjustable parameters. If you ignore the quarks, which uh, weigh very little, and they could just as well be massless, it would make life much easier. Uh, then you can calculate the mass of the hadron since it arises from the energy of the confined gluon field and the kinetic energy of the quarks. And that mass is completely calculable. Uh, in terms of what? Well, in terms of, say, the one of the masses. There, in QCD, there is no a priori scale. Uh, the proton uh, has a finite radius because of the confining strong force at large distances, which determines a radius, a mass, and uh, the ratio of the masses of the, of the uh, hadrons and of the glue balls can be our, our numbers. That someday, I predict, in a few hundred years, will be calculated precisely analytically. I mean, this theory in of itself is, will be a subject of mathematical physics and of theoretical physics for centuries. It would be very nice to calculate those mass ratios for massless quarks, say, exactly, if possible. Uh, now, that's sort of the best example we have of a theory where everything is calculable. There are no dimensionless numbers that can't be calculated. Now, of course, the real world has quarks, and they have masses, and we don't know where they come from or how to calculate them. And it, of course, also has the number of colors, which we don't know how to calculate. We don't know why it's three and not 79, which would make life much easier. And then, of course, there are other forces in nature, and perhaps most fundamentally the force of gravity, which has its own scale. And we might wonder why the QCD scale of a few hundred GV, MeV is so much lighter than the Planck mass. But, uh, and that's the real world. This last ratio, of course, is enormously small. It's one of the large numbers that Dirac worried about. Dirac pointed out many large or small, if you take the inverse numbers, like the proton the Planck mass ratio, which is exactly the QCD scale compared to the Planck scale. And uh, he had many other numbers, the size of the universe compared to the size of the atom, and so on, the number of atoms in the visible universe. They were all uh, of the order of this number or some power of it. And uh, he wondered, how could you ever calculate such numbers? Now, he might have resorted to anthropic arguments because 
The fact that this number is so small is why we're able to be here. If this number was of order one and the proton to the Planck, you know, was of order the Planck mass, then we would all be black holes and we wouldn't be asking this question. So therefore, you know, this is the kind of argument some of my friends engage in. But Dirac uh, was not, was a good physicist. He did not invoke such anthropic arguments. He just said, okay, I can't, nobody's gonna ever be able to, I have no idea how to calculate such numbers, but we can relate them. And he related the radius of the universe to the radius of the atom to this very small number. I think it's uh, the fourth power of the inverse. And then you, uh, you notice that the radius of the universe is growing because the universe is expanding. Therefore, some of the fundamental dimensionless parameters in the universe, like Newton's constant or, or the fine structure constant that determines the radius of the atom, would have to change in time as well. And that was a prediction to test this idea that these large numbers were related, and it was falsified. People now have very good limits on alpha prime and on G Newton prime, the, their time variation. But one nice thing about the standard model that's not often noted is that it solved that problem, at least qualitatively. We have no problem with understanding the proton to the Planck mass ratio because theory tells us that if the coupling, the strong coupling holds the quarks together is some reasonable coupling like one over 50 or one over 20, it doesn't really matter, at the unification scale, it will get stronger and stronger till it stops the quarks from getting out, which determines the size of the, uh, the proton, which determines its mass, so that the mass of the proton compared to the mass of the fundamental scale, or perhaps the unification scale, is given by QCD in this way, exponentially, small, and that within, you know, logarithmically explains this puzzle. Um, we hope to get similar explanations for the hierarchy of the Planck mass, unification mass, with the electroweak scale. That's why supersymmetry, one of the strongest arguments for supersymmetry, which hasn't yet been discovered, but that would give a similar argument for that hierarchy scale. Now, this gives me hope that we can explain the smallest number of all, some people say, the, cosmo the observed value of the cosmological constant. The way I like to think about it is to convert that to a mass scale relevant to the scale where supersymmetry is broken, which otherwise protects a cosmological constant. And that's a similar number. Maybe we can explain it, not by this mechanism, but by some mechanism um, that we haven't yet invented. Let's go back again. Then, how did we do theoretical physics, theoretical particle physics? Well, I was taught by Weinberg, whose course on field theory was the way I started to learn field theory, that uh, field theory is Feynman diagrams. That was it. You just had Feynman diagrams. The fields, forget about them, just Feynman diagrams. You don't need to know anything more. Now we have many, many much deeper understanding of quantum field theory and many uh, non-perturbative approaches. Path integrals, semi-classical approximations to path integrals, solitons, topological uh, defects, uh, instantons. We have lattice gauge theory, numerical solutions in a, in a controlled way to uh, quantum field theory. We have large N expansions. Uh, which defined a classical li another kind of classical limit of gauge theories. We have now a very powerful tool in the duality between gauge theories and string theories. And a new area, which is really fascinating, is an attempt using some new mathematical uh, theory to sum these divergent asymptotic expansions, Feynman diagrams, to get a definition and a calculational tool for, for uh, <coughs> quantum field theory. 
Most importantly is, the, is this duality. We now realize that this property of quarks, the confinement of the flux to a thin tube, which looks like a fat string, is really what, what led to string theory. And now we understand in a deep way how gauge theory and string theory are really the same thing. Then we had the 1971 was a time where people didn't yet refer to string theory as string theory. It used to be called the dual resonance model. 1971 was a turning point where it, people began to recover the results of the dual resonance model from a quantized extended string. And that was thought to be a re revolutionary new approach to particle theory. Instead of point-like particles as the basic constituents of matter, one had extended string-like objects. Closed strings, which gave rise to gravity. Open strings gave rise to mesons, originally gauge particles later. Now, we certainly believe that gauge theory and string theory are the same. But we also believe that string theory is not in the sense thought back in 1971, a revolutionary new approach. It's actually a different way of representing gauge theory. Um, this is partly due to uh, ADS-CFT, um, but many other indications that string theory is just an extension of a relativistic quantum field theory, which contains or is dual to uh, other mathematical formulations of the same physics, which we call string theory. The way I look at the framework we now have is we have what people call quantum field theory. It's a bad name because quantum field theory isn't a theory. It's a framework in which we embed, try to find a theoretical description of certain phenomena. And then we have what used to be called string theory, which isn't a theory either. It's a framework in which we can find many, many quantum states. And in fact, we now realize that these two frameworks are the same. Could more or less go continuously, or at least according to the, our current understanding, from one version of string theory, so-called, to quantum field theory initially to a very supersymmetric version of quantum field theory, but then you can distort that by adding masses and get to the standard model. So these are frameworks within which the standard theory is embedded. And with the modern tools of duality, we can use string theory to learn about experiments going on at RIC, probing new phases of quark-gluon um, fluid or plasma. Then, 1971, we could ignore gravity. And most of us did totally ignore gravity. Not Salam, by the way. Salam was always focused on gravity. He thought gravity would be a good way to do the strong interactions or something, some massive version of gravity. Uh, but we learned, of course, that we can't ignore gravity. Gravity appears to be essential in understanding unification. Extrapolating the standard model, you easily get to the Planck mass. Incorporating supersymmetry, which of course is gauged to supergravity, might be essential in understanding the breaking of supersymmetry. Gravitinos might be essential in the phenomenology of the supersymmetric world. And of course, as a dual description of the quantum structure of gauge theory. We now, many of us are in this direction, focused on dynamical space-time and beginning to question many of the fundamental characteristics of our most fundamental concept underlying our picture of physical reality, that of space-time. We can no longer think of space-time as a smooth manifold um, dynamical with small fluctuations that 
bend planets around the Earth. When we look closely at space-time and blow it up in, unfortunately, so far, mostly theoretically, we see wild, uncontrollable quantum fluctuations in the simplest quantization of Einsteinian gravity. And we've been led to many, many fascinating new ideas, some of them with observable consequences, such as space, does space have quantum dimensions? Or is physics supersymmetric? This, uh, these speculations have attracted many of us because they answer some of the, uh, they address some of the issues um, confronting the standard model, dark matter, the hierarchy, uh, and so on, but unification. But, uh, but they're, a, uh, they, they're a very useful set of speculations and have dominated uh, LHC searches for new physics so far with no results, uh, no indication. Uh, there's much, much room left. I'm still optimistic, hopeful that supersymmetry will show up at low energies. Low energies is TV energies. Um, but there are other questions about space-time that we ask nowadays. Does space-time have extra dimensions as required in certain stringy solutions? Uh, <clears throat> is space-time, and what about the other properties of space-time uh, that we take for granted even with the Einsteinian revolutions, that there is a reasonable description of a smooth manifold with fixed topology, with a fixed number of dimensions. All of these features fade in string theory. So now we ask, is space-time emergent? And uh, string theorists, quantum gravity people, um, I think just about, there's a consensus that in some sense space-time is emergent. Gravity, the dynamics of space-time emergent as well. And this is very difficult as a purely theoretical issue. How could you formulate the rules of physics without space-time? And then, back in 1971, astroparticle, astro the connection between particle physics and cosmology were uh, new. But now, in addition to trying to ask what fixes the dynamics of the world, we seem to be driven to the question what fixes the initial state. Particle physics, we only cared about the vacuum, what exists and is stable. But we, in a dynamical theory of space-time, we have to deal with the universe as a whole. We can't ignore gravity, so therefore we must deal with space-time itself and the Big Bang. So particle physics and cosmology are no longer a separate subject as they were 45 years ago, and we too must address how the universe began and the initial condition. Because the subject of our study now in particle gravitational physics is the universe, as Einstein told us, space-time history. And we can't avoid the question of what the beginning was, also what the end is. So if you have a theory that picks out a solution which has standard model forces, quarks and leptons calculate their masses, that solution being a gravity a theory of dynamical space-time will have a beginning, something happening when you extrapolate backwards in time, and it'll have some end, something that describes when you extrapolate forward in time. And if those are sick, presumably that solution is ruled out. You must address these questions, new questions for physics where we don't even know what the rules are. Then, back then, we believed that the symmetries of nature, they have the standard model, were determined by physical principles. 
that the constants of nature, say the fine structure constant, were calculable. We didn't know how to calculate them. We didn't know what the principles were, but we believed they were calculable. Some of my colleagues now believe they're determined by accidents in a landscape of possible universes and only picked out by anthropic arguments. Now, some of us still believe in that, <laughs> that we can calculate. We might not know how yet, but we can. So, we have a wonderful theory of elementary particles, a quantum field theory, which contains extended objects like strings, but the most important questions remain to be answered. We have fantastic instruments and experiments and fantastic speculations. So I think Salam would agree that the best is yet to come. Thanks. Yeah, David, you gave us some idea about how the, the QCD lambda parameter could come from a uh, logarithmic argument. That would, of course, be great because you just well, exponentiate, exponentiate a fairly large number to get a very large number. But how do you do that for the leptonic masses or any other, other parameters in the, in the theory? Well, as you know very well, the leptonic masses um, well, what you're, re you're really asking why, you know, about the Higgs couplings, right? The leptonic yes, masses, also. Leptonic masses are protected. So they're, you know, are protected by chiral symmetry. So there's no, uh, no issue of large numbers there. They're zero except for the spontaneous symmetry breaking. That's the electroweak scale. So all the questions about the, we of course don't know how to calculate those Yukawa couplings, but they're, of order one in the astronomical sense that I'm talking it, about. It includes the Higgs mass, of course. The Higgs yes. So mass the square issue parameter. is always for the electroweak sector, including the generation of masses for uh, fermions or for the Higgs, is, is that is a question of the hierarchy of the electroweak scale to the unification scale to the Planck scale. And there, there are, um, as you know, there are two approaches to that. One uh, which I find the most appealing is supersymmetry, which reduces it again to logarithms, or uh, technicolor, some variant of a composite structure, which again reduces it to logarithms uh, because it's essentially a QCD-like force at a slightly larger energy scale. If you want a larger gauge group, uh, technicolor or supersymmetry both reduce the hierarchy from an exponential to an ordinary number or from a big number to the logarithm of a big number. Uh, the same thing, by the way, the other big scale we have in physics is, um, well, we have two others that one is the neutrino masses, which are very small. There we have a different mechanism, the seesaw mechanism, which seems to explain that qualitatively. And then we have the, the weird uh, mass spectrum of the quarks and leptons, which has very big numbers of order 10,000. And there, there, the explanations are more, the ones I know of are more um, bizarre, numerical, vanishing of certain eigenvalues, mate, discrete symmetries. Uh, the only big number that is left that we don't have some to unproven yet, except for, Q except for proton mass, uh, large number um, understanding, qualitative, is the cosmological density, in my opinion. I hope you would have mentioned one more, which is the instantons. 
incitons also have an action which, which exponentiates yes. the uh, small numbers. Yes. So in other oh, words, okay. So there is there are other small numbers. The theta parameter of QCD, um, for which we, which whose mechanism for producing small CP violations is yet in the weak unproven. force. The weak inciton has a very very tiny. Uh, yes, but of it doesn't. It does it, it right. But uh, well, uh, and it it doesn't appear. So it does indeed. That's a small effect but not one that is related to solving any problem. Uh, as you know, originally there was hope that that might l explain the s another cosmological small number, like uh, the number of baryons in the universe compared to the number of photons, 10 to the minus 9, doesn't work. It's too small. So there are other small effects in, um, in our theoretical framework, indeed. Um, but there may, there may be other uh, not, animals of a similar nature, but other not, incentons. But yes, but they, the, only the only place where I can think of that that was hoped to solve an ob observational problem was the number of baryons in the universe. Right. Um, yes? You made the comment as to whether Salam ever abandoned his field theory roots, and the answer is he never did, actually. He doubled in rigid poles, he doubled in higher symmetries, he doubled in dispersion relations, yes. but all this at the back of his yeah. mind, he had field theory. And he, and yeah, he, he kept uh, on doing it, too. Yes, did, did you ever discuss with him uh, why he wasn't <laughs> swept away like the rest of British physicists? No, I, th I think that those were his theory. roots, actually, the field theory. That Sorry? Field was theory was his root. I mean, he started yes. off that way. Yeah. The other very fascinating thing about Salam was that, you know, he, ma he became famous for his technical work on renormalization. Uh, I actually, as a student, tried to read some of those papers. God. <laughs> yeah. And then he became less and less very quickly dro dropped to being that technical. But he had a terrific intu intuition as to what the final answer should oh, be. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, of course. Any more questions? Um, I thought you were a little bit uh, evasive uh, about solving QCD analytically. <coughs> and <coughs> in some sense, I mean, uh, Although you didn't quite put it that way, but uh, your approach is not too different than what uh, Dyson said about strong interactions that it will not be solved even well, in 100 years. There are, no, 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 it's a little different. Um, <laughs> you know, there are areas of physics that are well-defined and separate, right. like fluid dynamics. Right. We know that fluid dynamics is wrong, after all, you know. Fluids are made of atoms. But fluid dynamics is a well-defined part of mathematical physics. And whether Navier-Stokes equations have finite time solutions is a problem that's been open for hundreds of years and is now worth a million dollars, according to the Clay Institute. So not only, you know, so, Understanding fluid dynamics is uh, still an unsolved, partly unsolved problem, very important uh, practically, but also uh, fascinating as mathematical physics. And I have no doubt that QCD will remain that way because, you know, it is a complete theory. It has no problems, there's no parameters, it, 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 ignore the mass of the quarks or put them in, doesn't matter. Um, and uh, we already have the hydrogen atom. We have the limiting case where it ha we now know that the theory is, for a large number of colors, integrable. Right. So uh, that supersymmetric version of QCD can be deformed by 
giving masses to the supersymmetric partners of the gluons. And that flows, if you want. You can deform that theory continuously to QCD. So there's a close cousin which, for, for, in, for large n, is actually integrable and almost solved analytically. Okay. I would say it's 50% solved analytically. And people have hopes that that integrability could actually be extended away from the, su the maximally supersymmetric case. Uh, now, of course, QCD itself um, is, is, harder, is even harder than just breaking supersymmetry. You have to have a theory with confinement, and that is going to be difficult. But Numerically, we're now in the position of solving it. I yes, don't know yes. what solving means. Analytically is nice. I would imagine that in 100 years, we should be able to do a 1 over n expansion systematically, analytically, maybe 200 years. But remember, theories in basic theories like this in physics don't go away. They'll become part of something bigger. But people still find new solutions of you know, strange objects with which ref, which are invisible using Maxwell's equations. Which so uh, I predict a long life for QCD, both you know in its exploratory phase of discovering new phases of matter, and uh, perhaps with astrophysical applications or who knows what, but also just as mathematical physics in the same way that. Uh, we still study Maxwell's equations and Navier-Stokes equations, and that will go on. And there'll probably be a Clay Prize. There is a Clay Prize for proving that QCD is a rigorously defined mathematical structure with a mass gap, with confinement. You're going to also win a hundred, uh, a million dollars. And. I've been told by mathematicians that they regard that clay prize for QCD as the most difficult of all the clay prizes, harder than the Riemann conjecture. So if I told you that the Riemann conjecture won't be proved for 100 years, you'd probably say, well, that's reasonable. So I think it'll take a, a long time. Um, speaking about electroweak theory, I mean, one, currently the most compelling, one of the most compelling explanations for the uh, baryon asymmetry in the universe actually is leptogenesis, which relies on the seesaw mechanism, and then the spellerons of the electroweak theory actually convert leptons yes. to baryons. So, right, absolutely, and that is ta uh, <laughs> one of our, yes, that's the current hope. It's not, it just we comes don't out. even it just know, comes out. It we comes don't out. even know experimentally that CP is violated, that um, the magnitude of uh, CP violation, if it, we don't know that it's non-zero. So that's a hope, but it is based on, yeah. it's not instantons exactly, it's phalerons, but it's similar to what Gerard was remarking. So yeah. leptogenesis yeah. might be the answer to why they're so, why they're bar 10 to the minus 9 barium. One other small remark is that from the Planck measurements in WMAP, we know now that the energy density of the universe during observable inflation is about three orders of magnitude below the Planck scale, which is, so in other words, that is an interesting thing to know. Hubble constant about four orders below the Planck scale. So what do you deduce from that? Well, it, uh, it, I deduce that quantum gravity effects may not be so relevant for quantum gravity for the observable universe. That's indeed uh, what has made possible modeling uh, the CMB and the inflationary history yeah. of the universe. On the other hand, the people who want to understand inflation go back to Planckian times and Planckian energies easily without a without blushing. Yeah, then they get into trouble, of course. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs>